Well, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Cornerstone Online. So glad to be with you again. Uh, I've been uh, uh, studying all week and God's given me some uh, wonderful things, wonderful truths from his word to share with you today. Um, before we do that, I'd like to introduce my sidekick. Come on over here, Michael. Say hi. Hello, everybody. He's my good buddy. Okay, you can go down the stairs, Michael. <laughs> he likes to come with me and help me sing, because I need a lot of help. So you sing too, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, just praise God together. This song's called He Reigns. I think you'll remember it. It's the song of the redeemed Rising from the African plain It's the song of the forgiven Drowning out the Amazon rain The song of Asian believers Filled with God's holy fire It's every tribe, every tongue, every nation A love song born of a grateful it's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. Let it rise above the four winds, caught up in the heavenly sound. Let praises echo from the towers of cathedrals to the faithful gathered underground. Of all the songs sung from the dawn of creation, some were meant to persist. Of all the bells rung from a thousand steeples, none rings truer than this. It's all God's children singing glory, glory. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. And all the powers of darkness tremble at what they just heard. Cause all the powers of darkness can't drown out a single word. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah. All God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns. Come on, sing again. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he reigns, he reigns. It's all God's children singing glory, glory, hallelujah, he Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the time we could spend together today. And thank you for that song that, that helps us to remember that you are God, you are King of Kings, you are Lord of Lords, and you reign. So thank you, God, for the opportunity to gather together and open your word and hear how it would speak to us today in the midst of this uh, pandemic that we're, that we're facing right now, um, this coronavirus, Lord. Uh, we, we know, Father, that you have a, a plan, you have a, a, a desire, Lord, to reach out to us and let us know that you are still God and you are still in control and that you love us so much. So thank you for this time, Lord. May you be honored and may you be blessed by it, Father. As always, we ask your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and open our minds. You be the teacher. You be the guide. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well... Thank you, Michael, for helping me sing that song. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, I hope you, you got them next to you right now. I always want you to get a, a piece, of, piece of paper and a pencil to write with uh, because I want you to write some things down. We, we forget so much of what we hear, and so I want you to write things down so you can refer to it later. Uh, but for the last six weeks, we've been in this series, and my goal has been to share with you uh, practical biblical principles that will help us navigate this pandemic with calmness, with competence, 
and with confidence. I want us to learn how to control the controllable things that are in our lives and to trust God for all the things that we can't control because there are so, mer so many. A story is told about a photographer for a national magazine. He was assigned to get some photos of this great uh, big forest fire. Uh, smoke at the scene, it hampered his efforts. Uh, so he asked his home office to hire a plane so he could fly over and take some shots. Well, arrangements were made and he was told at once uh, to go to the airport nearby where a plane would be waiting for him. Well, he arrived at the airport and a plane was warming up, uh, sure enough, on the runway. He jumped in with his equipment and he yelled, let's go, let's go. The pilot swung the plane into the wind and soon they were off in the air. Uh, flying over the north side of the fire, uh, the, the, the photographer yelled, um, fly down and, and uh, get some low level passes so I can take some good pictures. Why, asked the pilot. Because I'm going to take pictures, cried the photographer. I'm a photographer, and photographers take pictures. Well, after a pause, the pilot said, you mean you're not the instructor? <laughs> you know you're in trouble when you're in a plane and there's no pilot or no instructor. Truth, truthfully, this is often how we uh, feel about life, uh, like we're flying without a pilot. But I'm here to remind us today that as believers, we have the best pilot we could ever ask for. He is God, and he's always in control of this plane we call life. Two of my favorite promises are in the book of Jeremiah. One of them is Jeremiah 32, 27. Did you write that down? Jeremiah 32, 27, it says this, I am the Lord God of all mankind. Is there anything too hard for me? I love that verse. Of course, it implies, no, there's nothing too hard for God. Another one of my favorite promises in the Bible is Jeremiah uh, 33, 3. Would you write that in? I call that God's phone number. Uh, Jeremiah 33, 3, because it says this, Call to me, and I will answer you, and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. Please know God is waiting to help you in anything any, any crisis, any problem that you might have. He wants to help. So the first thing I want to do today is to take a survey. I'd like you to tell me what's going on in your life. Now, of course, you can't tell me over the, the uh, camera here, the, the, the recording, but I want to know how you feel about your life. So I want you to write it down. How's your spiritual, spiritual journey going? I'm really interested in, in that kind of information because I really do care about you and love you, each and every one of you, individually. So give me some information about yourself. Write down one thing you're thankful for. There's got to be something, even in the midst of this, uh, this crisis, there's got to be something you're thankful for. Um, and write, write down one thing that's a challenge, one thing that's a problem uh, that, that, that you, you're facing right now or you're gonna know, you know you're going to be facing in the next few weeks. I want you to share those with me as your pastor. One thing that you're uh, facing uh, in this time, one thing that you're f thankful for, one thing that you're facing. Let's just, just be honest and say, uh, Frank, here's a challenge, a problem that I'm facing right now, or I know I'm going to fail, uh, face in the next few weeks. Then, it, then email me or text me. Um, let, let me know somehow. Uh, you can even put it in the mail and mail it to the church. Um, uh, let me know so uh, it, it will help me pray for you more specifically because I do pray for you every week and I like to pray in specifics. That way we know how God's working. We, we can see God answering those prayers. And it will help me to prepare uh, messages in the coming months to, uh, so I can address things uh, as the Bible addresses all the things that we deal with. None of us know what's going to happen, what the rest of the year is going to bring us. That's why the future can be a little intimidating, a little frightening, uh, frightening at times. Uh, whenever human beings are involved, um, there, there never is complete permanent security in anything. We cannot count on the world being a better place when we come out of this pandemic. We cannot count on there being world peace. We can't count on the economy. We can't count on our politicians, regardless of who gets elected. We can't even count on the fact that your loved ones will all be here a year from now. But as I told you last week, one of the marks of maturity is when we begin to realize most of the world is out of our control. You're not God, neither am I. We cannot control everything that happens. Instead, we begin to focus on the things we can control, things uh, uh, we are responsible for, 
then we can begin to accept the things that are out of our control and not sweat about them. That's emotional maturity when you reach that point. While there are many things we cannot, uh, cannot count on during this coronavirus, there is one thing we can count on, and that's God is in control. Right in your outline, 1 Chronicles 29.11. 1 Chronicles 29.11. Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord. We adore you as being in control of everything. Did you hear that? Being in control of everything. The Bible calls this God's sovereignty. That means he's in control. That means he's the absolute authority in life. He is in charge and he is in control. The Bible teaches, and it's plainly obvious, that God is in control of nature. He created nature. He sustains nature. He overrules nature when he wants to. And when he does that, we call it a miracle. God is in control of history. We're moving toward the end. I read the end of the book, Revelations. We're moving toward the end. Of the, uh, the end. And, uh, and we need to know that life is not circular, just repeating itself over and over again. It's linear, it's, and it's history moving toward a focal point, a grand climax, if you will. One day Jesus is going to come back. God is bringing this world toward that spot where Jesus will come again, uh, and there will be judgment day. History is his story. We're not uh, going through just random acts of events in life. Uh, there is a grand design. There is a purpose. There is a plan. And God is in control of it all. Even more specifically and personally, God is in control of your life and in mine. You may not recognize it, but in many areas of, of life, we have no choice at all. You didn't choose uh, where you were going to be born. You didn't choose when you were going to be born. You didn't choose uh, the parents you were going to be born to. You didn't choose your nationality. You didn't choose your basic makeup. You didn't choose your talents, your ability, the giftedness that you have, your interests, your personality. You didn't choose those things. Every gene in your body was designed by God. He made you to be you. And you are a unique creation of His. You say, well, if God is in complete control, do I have any free, free choice, free will at all? Do I have any decisions in my life? Of course you do. We do have the freedom to choose, which is God's greatest gift to us, next to Jesus Christ. But choice is limited. Let's look at it this way. You could take a cruise to Hawaii, and while you're on that cruise, you could go to the top deck, you can go to the bottom deck, you can eat and whenever you want to, uh, you can go swimming, you can do whatever you wanted to, but you could not stop the cruise from going to Hawaii. That's where it's going. It's going to get there regardless of what you choose to do while you're on that cruise. In life, we do have the freedom to make choices and we are free to choose things in our life. We can choose, uh, we can make good choices and we can make bad choices, but we're not free from the consequences of those choices. There will always be consequences to our choices. Ultimately, God is in control. Now, for a believer, I think that's really comforting news. In a world that seems to be spinning out of control, as we face this pandemic, um, we don't know what in the world is going to happen. But we do know that God is in control. And that brings great comfort to us. Specifically, there are three things we need to remember about God's control. And this is where I want you to write these down, okay? Number one, I want you to remember these. Because God is in control, my plans will have a limit. Would you write that down? Number one, because God is in control, my plans will have a limit. Now let me explain what I mean by that. People always say, the sky is the limit. Well, that's not necessarily true. God does put limits on things, and he sets limits. You need to write down Proverbs 19.21. Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Did you hear that? Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Now, would you agree that not everything we plan goes as planned? <laughs> would you agree that God often has a better idea and that he often changes our plans? At, and, and at best, our plans are tentative. The Bible says in Proverbs 16.1, we uh, may make our plans, but God has the final word. 
How many of you have ever had God change your plans? I'm raising my hand. Are you raising your hand? <laughs> of course we have. How many of you did not marry the first person you thought you might marry? I mean, I knew who I was going to marry in the second grade. She didn't know it, but I knew it. Fortunately, God had a better idea and introduced me to my wife in my late 20s. But, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we make these plans and God has a better idea. Now, God had a better idea for my marriage, but God off always has, has, uh, changes our plans. One of my plans growing up, I was going to be a rock star. Man, did that turn out different. God had different plans, way different plans for my life than I did. We make our plans, but our, you see, our plans have a limit. I'm not saying we shouldn't have goals. I'm not saying that we shouldn't make plans. In fact, the Bible says we ought to make plans. Proverbs 16.9 says we should make our plans counting on God to direct us. Make our plans and let God direct those plans. He's saying, now don't be presumptuous like, I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm going to do. And I know exactly what's best for me. But we really don't know. We really don't. The more mature we become as believers, the more flexible we become. The more open to change we are without getting an ulcer and worrying about it all the time. Why? Because the more mature we become, the more we realize how little we know. Remember that old phrase, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know? It's so true. When I was 16 years old, I knew everything. And my parents, they knew nothing. It was amazing how smart they got as I became 25, 30, 35. They just kept getting smarter and smarter. The older we get, the more we realize our best plans, our best efforts are only tentative. And I am not in control, but God is. My plans have a limit. So make plans, but the key is to cooperate with God and pray about your plans. We should make our plans, the Bible says, counting on God to direct us. Planning without prayer is presumption. We need to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? One of the prayers I prayed probably as much as any prayer I've prayed since I, uh, in the last 18 years since I've passed, been pastoring this church, I'm always praying, God, what's your next step? That's a pretty good prayer uh, for you to pray as well, as well uh, while we're in the middle of this pandemic. Lord, what, what's the next step with my family? What's the next step with my finances? What's the next step in that relationship I'm involved in? What's the next step in a ministry that you might have for me? Instead of praying, God, bless what I'm doing. We do that all the time, don't we? We make our plans and say, God, bless what we're doing. But we ought to start pray praying before we make our plans, God, help me to do what you want me to do. Help me to do what you're already blessing. I want to be a part of what you're doing. And so that means my plans have limits. All right, number two, number two. Because God is in control, my problems have a purpose. Would you write that down? My problems have a purpose. Because God is in control, my problems have a purpose. I don't know about you, but that's good news. Life is not a series of random events with no meaning, uh, meaning. accidents that just come and go in life. Uh, life has meaning, life has purpose. If you are a believer, you understand nothing comes into the believer's life without the Heavenly Father's permission, without his permission. Everything that happens in our, our lives, even the bad, is Father filtered. It can't come into your life without his permission. So our problems have a purpose. Now, please hear me. I'm not saying everything that happens to us is God's will, that God causes all the bad things that happen in our life. That's not true. God will not all, uh, God's will is not always done on earth. That's why Jesus told, told us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because on, in heaven, God's will is always done perfectly. On earth, it is not. Because he has given us free choice. Now, I'm not saying that God causes bad things to happen in our life. He doesn't. God does not cause our problems. I mean, he doesn't have to. We do a good enough job of that on our own, don't we? But he does permit problems. 
He does permit bad things to happen. He, he does grow, because he does grow our faith through the problems. And he does, he, he does use them for good in our lives. So problems come, problems go, but, but God uses them uh, to grow our faith and he uses them for good in our lives. And the grand de design, the greater scheme of things, if we cooperate with his plan, if we trust him, if we maintain the right attitude uh, through the trials and the tribulations that we go through, God can take any situation and bring good out of it. That's what the Bible says, that he will take any problem that we have, anything that's going on in our life, even a pandemic, and he can bring good out of it. God doesn't cause our problems, but he does permit them. He did not uh, put Paul in prison, but he allowed him to go to prison. And while he was there, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, which uh, he would never have written had, had he not been put in a little room and kept chained to, to a, a Roman guard because Paul was too much of an activist. I mean, he was going all the time. He would, didn't have time to sit down and write, but God gave him a chance to sit down and write. God could have made Pharaoh uh, uh, say yes right away and let the people go, but he allowed Pharaoh to say no, no to Moses ten times. Why? So God could use these wonderful miracles that the people would never forget and they could see the mighty acts of God. God could have kept Jesus off the cross. He didn't put them there. Satan's plan was to put Jesus on the cross, kill him, and be done with him. But his plan was spoiled, wasn't it? Because, because God loves to turn crucifixions into resurrections. He loves to bring good out of bad. He loves to bring something good out of something evil. He loves to bring growth out of pain. He loves to bring growth uh, out, of, out of hurt. That's what God does. He's good at that. He's an expert at that. He's an expert at turning things around. He's an expert at, uh, he's the God of, uh, of, re of recovery. God is in the business of changing lives. He doesn't want to waste anything. God says that my problems, the things that I go through, have a purpose. So I can relax, because no matter what happens in this pandemic, God is going to have a purpose behind it. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 through 7 says this, At present you may be temporarily harassed with all kinds of trials. This is no accident. It happens to prove your faith, which is infinitely more valuable than gold. He's saying that this is not an accident, but God is working in it. He didn't cause it, but he... he uh, he allowed it, and he's working in it. You remember the story of Joseph? Um, <laughs> Joseph ends up uh, second in command in, in Egypt. Uh, this is what happened to Joseph. God, uh, 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 yeah, in Genesis, Joseph, said, Joseph says, You meant this for bad, but God meant it for good. His brothers cheated him. You remember the story. He cheated him. They, uh, they mistreated him. They sold him into slavery. Uh, he ended up being accused falsely of rape and thrown into prison for a crime that he never committed. All kinds of bad things happened to Joseph. Did God cause those bad things? No, of course not. Did he allow those bad things? Yes, he did. But you see, God was working in it. Joseph ends up second in command in Egypt. He saves his people. He saves Egypt too. And he says to his brothers later, you meant all this for bad, but God meant it for good. So what's the key to my response to the problems that I try, uh, uh, all the things that I mess up in my life? If I know God is in control and my plans have a limit and my problems have a purpose, what's my response? 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 7. Write that in. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 7. This is the reason we never lose heart. We never get discouraged. In other words, we never give up. These troubles, which are temporary, are winning for us a permanent, glorious, and solid reward, all out of proportion to our pain. The res you see, the, the correct response to problems that we're going through during this pandemic is to look past the pain and to the purpose. Stop asking why and start asking what. God, what do you want me to learn through this? Look past the pain and see God's purpose. Let me encourage you by reading Romans 8. I love this message translation in Romans chapter 8. Let me read that for you. So what do you think? 
with God on our side like this, how can we lose? If God is for us, who can be against us? It doesn't matter what the future brings. I have a hope, and that hope has a name, Jesus Christ. He is our hope, not the future, not the government, not society, not even my own family. My hope has a name, and his name is Jesus Christ. If God be for us, who can be against us? Do you think anyone is going to be able to drive a wedge between us and Christ's love for us? There is no way. Not trouble, not hard times, not hatred, not hunger, not homelessness, not bullying threats, not backstabbing, not even the worst sins in Scripture can separate us from the love of God. Don't you love that? Uh, none of this phases us because Jesus loves us. I'm absolutely convinced that nothing, nothing living or dead, angelic or demonic, today or tomorrow, high or low, thinkable or unthinkable, absolutely nothing can get between us and God's love because of the way Jesus, our master, has embraced us. Isn't that great? That's the hope for such a time as this. That's the hope for the rest of our lives. God is in control. My, my plans have limits, but you know what? I don't care because I know God is in charge. My problems have a purpose. He'll handle them. He'll help me. He'll bring good out of those problems. Let me give you number three and the last thing. Number three, because God is in control, my prayers have an impact. Because God is in control, my prayers have an impact. Uh, in other words, they're not just a waste of time. Have you ever wondered or do you wonder if prayer really works? I used to wonder that all the time. When I was young in my faith, I would get down on my knees and start praying and close my eyes and Satan would whisper in my ear, Hey, Frank, you're wasting your time. Nobody is hearing this. God is not listening. You're just wasting your time. Uh, your prayer is not going to get above the ceiling. You know that. You're, you're conning yourself. You're, you're psyching yourself up. You're, you're trying uh, psychological tricks. This prayer thing doesn't work. It's all just mumbo-jumbo. It's a waste of time. Does he ever say that, those kind of things to you, when you try to pray? The truth is, God's word says prayer works. And if you've been a believer for any length of time and you're mature in your faith, you've seen how prayer works. Be Why does it work? Because God is in control. If God were not in control, prayer would be an absolute waste of time because he wouldn't be able to do anything about it. He'd listen and go, okay, fine, yeah, too bad. But because God is in control, he can control the uncontrollable. Listen, you don't have to know the key man if you know the man who holds the keys, and that's God. He can do things that you've never thought possible. Prayers have an impact because God is in control. That's the basis of all miracles, God's sovereignty. If he wants to overrule nature, he can. If he wants to overrule human law, he can. If he wants to overrule government, he can. He can do whatever he wants to do, and we call that a miracle when he does. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.20, write that down, Ephesians 3.20, God is able to do far more than we could ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Did you hear that last line? If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Since God is in control, then what's the best way to get through this pandemic? Acknowledge his control over my life. Don't fight it. Don't run from it. Don't resist it. Accept it. Cooperate with it. Be grateful for it. Enjoy the blessings that will come because of it. Thank God for it. In his control, listen, in his control, nothing can devastate you. Did you hear me? In God's control, in God's love, nothing can devastate you. Nothing that happens for the next few months during this pandemic can devastate you if you're trusting in the one who controls it all. Let him control the uncontrollable and stop worrying about it. Some of you worry about your life all the time, or you worry about your finances all the time, or you worry about losing your children, or you worry about dying yourself or getting ill from this virus. You can't control those things. 
Ultimately, they are uncontrollable. Yes, you can take reasonable precautions, and we should, but ultimately, God is in control, and we can trust him. When, when we get through this pandemic, and we will, I want to get through it with peace, with confidence, and with hope, not with fear, because the Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. Instead of focusing on the things we can't change, focus on what never changes. How about that? What never changes? God's love never changes. God's promises never change. And God's purpose for my life never changes. Uh, uh, God is not a liar. God's promises, his words, always true. It's never going to change. God's purpose for your life uh, is never going to change. Jeremiah 31, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Psalm 33, his plans endure forever. His purposes, his purposes last eternally. Isaiah 40, the word of God shall stand forever. God's love, God's truth, and God's purpose for my life are never going to change. That's what we focus on when we're in the middle of this chaos. You want to know the best way to get through COVID-19? Focus on the things that never change, the things we just talked about. Focus on those things and then establish a spiritual basis for your life. How do you establish a spiritual basis for your life? I, I use a simple acrostic and the, the, um, the word is base, B-A-S-E. Let me go over those before we close very, really quickly. The B stands for believe. Believe Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and showed he was God by coming back to life. That's what Easter is all about. Jesus' death and resurrection. B, believe. A, accept. Accept God's free forgiveness for my sin. I'm so grateful that Jesus Christ loves me no matter who I am or what I've done. Aren't you grateful for that? Listen, you're never too bad. You're never too far gone. You're never a hopeless case to accept God's forgiveness. There are no hopeless cases in God's book. Yes, we can come to him and he does. You remember those old etch-a-sketches? I love those things. Uh, you if you make a mistake, you mess up, you just turn it over and shake it. And that's what God does to the sin in our life. He just shakes it. He turns it upside down, shakes it, and the slate is wiped clean. So I accept God's free forgiveness for all my sins. They're all wiped away. The S in base stands for switch. Switch to God's plan for my life. Switch, turn around. The Bible calls that repentance. The Greek word literally means to change your mind or to change direction. Change the way you're headed. When you become a believer, God doesn't slow you down. I've never slowed down since I've become a believer. He just changes your direction and you're running in the right way. I love that. You see, that's switching to God's plan. It's saying, God, instead of me trying to do my plan, let's go with your plan because I know your plan is much better. Um, let, uh, let me become what you may be to be in the first place. The E is for express. Express my desire for Christ to be the director, the CEO, the Lord and Savior of my life. Tell him that's what you want. You don't become a Christian until you ask. God doesn't come into your heart until you ask him to. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a promise made by God himself. You can count on it. Count on it. You see so many people miss heaven by 18 inches. They believe, they got head knowledge, they know that, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, he was who he said he was, and he came to die, but it's never gotten down to their heart. They miss heaven by 18 inches because they never accept it. Listen, Satan believes in God, but he's never committed his life to God. He's never accepted Jesus Christ in his heart. Listen, I don't want anybody getting through this pandemic without learning to focus on what never changes and having established a spiritual base for their lives. If you're serious about establishing a spiritual base for your life, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. God will hear you. Just tell him. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today thanking you for being in control. Thank you for being in God. Help us to remember that in all things, we're, you're working for our good in our lives because you love us and you are in control. I, I, I want to look to you, Lord, in this crisis. I want to seek you, not a solution, not a quick fix, not a way out. I want to ask for your wisdom. God, I need your wisdom. 
Forgive me for being too busy, too noisy to hear you whisper in my life, to hear that quiet, still voice, to spend more time in prayer, and not just talking, but listening. I want to be quiet. I want to hear your voice. I want to spend time with you on a daily basis and read your word and be quiet and listen to you and pray. Lord, help me to stop asking why and start asking, what do you want me to learn? Help me to, to give thanks in all circumstances. I know we're not supposed, we don't need to give thanks for the circumstances, but in all circumstances, um, because we know that you'll grow us through those circumstances, through those things. Develop care, mature character in me, God. Grow me up. Help me to focus on that which never changes, your love for me, your purpose for me, and your promises to me. I want to throw the whole weight of all my anxiety on you right now. Thank you that I'm your personal concern, that you love me that much. I want to be a godly man or a godly woman. Father, I want to, uh, I want to say to you today that no matter what happens, I'm going to trust you. No matter what the ending is, I'm going to trust you because you are a good God. If you never invited Christ into your life, would you just say this in your heart? He'll hear you. Just say, dear God, I don't understand it all, but I believe you sent your son for me to die on the cross for my sins so I can be forgiven. I'm sorry for my sins, and I want to live the rest of my life the way you want me to. Please put your spirit into my life to direct me. Jesus Christ, come into my heart right now. Be the CEO, the manager of my life, the Lord and Savior of my life. I want to learn to trust you. I want to learn to love you. And I want to live the rest of my life for you until I see you face to face in all of your glory. Father, we love you. And in the midst of this time, we just want to share our hearts with you and thank you for the way you guide us and the way you direct us. Help us to keep focused on you and your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us today. Um, if you prayed that prayer of salvation, I'd sure like to know. If you would call the office, 707-5234. Uh, I'd love to be able to give you a Bible, uh, get you started on your walk and your growth um, with Jesus Christ, uh, and uh, uh, just, uh, um, just be happy, excited, joyful with you for your new decision and your life change. Um, I always like to, to remind you, if you haven't been bringing in your tithes, your gifts, your offering, uh, the Bible says bring them to the storehouse. Uh, we're, still, we're still doing ministry. We're still feeding people. Uh, the the, the uh, lines have gotten longer, uh, but we're still distributing food. Um, we're still keeping the, the doors open, the lights on, the bills paid. So um, if you haven't been able to bring your tithe in, uh, you can bring it uh, during office hours. Monica is here on um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and we can lock it up and then and to get it deposited. Or you can go right to our website, cornerstoneanddixon.com, uh, click on giving, and you can sign up for online giving. Uh, Danielle, my wife, and I do that. It makes it very simple. And it's a part of our, our worship of God and being obedient to God and giving back to Him. So um, until we meet again, uh, stay safe, stay well, and may God bless you.